Fernando Hernandez. Uh, I want to present here an introduction to at-risk using for uh, use for oil and gas applications. Uh, this is a whole universe by itself, so I'm going to just uh, be able to cover most of the basic things, especially working probably a couple of models once I've established um, a couple of um, components or major components of what at-risk does on top of Excel. Um, if you already see, I'm on top of Excel, and at risk has been placed on top of that. So it actually takes uh, just a couple of seconds to start at risk. As you can see over here, I'm initializing Microsoft Excel, placing at risk on top of that. So my Excel spreadsheet, whatever model I have on top of that, will become a at riskable model. Let's put it that way. That is a model in which Monte Carlo simulation or statistical distributions can be placed on top of that. So, uh, assuming uh, I'm going to assume a couple of things. Uh, first of all, first of all, is that we are knowledgeable enough to know uh, about the industry generals. Um, I am not an expert on oil and gas myself. I'm just a finance uh, um, guy with a lousy MBA on top of that. And what I would uh, want to add, that's one assumption. The other assumption is. Uh, that we don't know too much about what at risk uh, does on top of an Excel spreadsheet. So let's assume for the time being that I can model uh, anything, and in this case I am going to model a, for example, a decline rate, a declination or decline rate uh, for a specific well with a couple of distribution functions or parameters to define such a declination rate. Let us define that with a log normal distribution. Uh, assuming a couple of uh, parameters, say that my uh, uh, monthly or annual or period, period declination rate is, say, whatever that is, a 5% declination rate, with a sigma of, say, 3%. That is, we're recognizing that there's variation upon whatever we want to somehow model over here. So the beauty of the software is the ability to take this information, which is deterministic in nature so far, and be able to insert a distribution function on top of that. Uh, distribution functions uh, can be defined over here uh, with a defined distribution, and you'll be able then to see that the software does contain several tabs with the common ones, the favorite ones, discrete, continuous, alternate parameters, special, the ones that you've added uh, customarily on top of your address library, and finally, all of the distribution functions. At the last count, there's like 84 distribution functions that can be used over here and placed, as you can see here, uh, for example, cell D2. So on top of cell D2, I already know that I am going to model such a declination rate with a log normal distribution, which certainly belongs to the common um, section. So I'll just click on top of that. And in order to refer whatever information I have on top of D2 of my curve, I'll just uh, link it back to Excel using this button and assigning respectively a mu and a sigma, that is a mean and standard deviation that can somehow model that. So as you can see over here on top of my cell, I'll be able then to define such a distribution function with its respective um, characteristics uh, or statistics, a min, a max, a mean, a mode, a median, standard deviation, so on and so forth, percentiles, and as you, at each one of these percentiles, I can, for, for example, define, say, an IDF percentile, that is leaving 10% on the right-hand side. So I already know that my 90th percentile is uh, 8.726 percentage points, at which there's a 10% chance of being over that. Same thing on the other hand, I may be able to define, for example, a 20th percentile, and in this case, this number would match 2.689% probability over there. So in other words, I can say, and I can, by moving these two parameters over here, I'd be able to define different percentages or percentiles on top of that cell. So whenever, whenever I go back and OK over here, I'll be then able to see that there's a distribution function on top of that that looks like that. It is just a standard Excel function on top of that cell. And by turning on my dice icon, this one over here, I may then be able to F9, that is to recalculate different numbers, and to, as you can see, by recalculating, that is by throwing my dice over there, I'll be able to then somehow um, throw random numbers along the curve that I just defined. 
So if I were to, for example, simulate that is to iterate or generate a 10,000 different random numbers along this cell, I may do this by starting a simulation. And as you can see, the software in this case will, what, what it will do, it will draw 10,000 different data points along my distribution function. Uh, so far, I've uh, drawn like uh, 400 of them. And the software, once it's uh, stopped, it'll be able to tell me that this distribution function actually will uh, liken itself to whatever I have on top of that. I can always speed this process up by turning off my display updating feature off. So this will run much faster. And it will also run much faster if I turn my updating uh, a chart feature off as well. So as a matter of fact, it only takes a matter of a, a couple of seconds for the software to simulate and then be able to draw a distribution function on top of that cell. And once you've understood that, that is the very nature of what we've done, which is to simulate, that is to draw random numbers along the curves of different distribution functions, you'll then be able to start modeling and working your own models on top of that. Now this could be something as defined by two parameters defined by uh, geologic information or output information. Or I could also use distribution functions such as a PERT one. A PERT one uses three parameters. In this case, I would probably use a min, a most likely value or mode, and a max value. So if I could define, for example, a certain cost in which I already know that the most likely value is 150 with a min of 100 and a max of, say, 300, I can always depict that by inserting a distribution function just by typing in any, uh, writing that down as any other function in Excel, making reference to the three parameters that would define such a distribution, I'd be then able to draw the distribution function, and the same thing applies over here. That is, numbers being drawn upon that cell, and then be able to simulate results upon your output cells. That is the basic uh, concept. Let us then build something a little bit better. So for example here, I've defined a model. Uh, let me just detail it uh, really, really fast. It is a model in which uh, an oil producer X must evaluate whether it pays or not to invest in a certain artificial lift technology after operating a well for 12 months. So we've been operating this month for 12 months. We've got monthly information here starting on January 2015 all the way for the next 60 months and we want to somehow be able to see whether it pays or not to apply, to apply a certain artificial lift technology upon that. The cost for such a technology, whatever that is, uh, I really don't care uh, technology wise on that, would imply a cost of $75,000 all the way up to $100,000 with a most likely expenditure of 80 k so the question here is, given that technology, would it pay to apply it or not? Uh, as you can see over here, my model is full of colors. And it has been full of colors because each one of these distribution functions over here already contain a distribution function. For example, these major six uh, variables over here have been already defined on top of my model in terms of this. For example, the cost of my artificial lift expenditure over here, as you can see, is a per distribution. And that is because I just don't have enough data. I may only have ability to hire an expert. And he or she would, help, would be able to tell me a min, a most likely, and a max, which are these three parameters that I've defined over here. So what I'm saying over here is that every single iteration, I am generating a different number with respect to my artificial lift expenditure cost over here. Now, my initial output has been modeled with a log normal distribution function. As you can see over here, my output has been defined now, in this case, with a log normal distribution. I am assuming an average output of 800 units and a variation that is a standard deviation of D3 of 100 units. So that will give me this uh, um, curve over here. And so on and so forth, the other variables, such as the relative output booth with the lift. What I'm assuming here is that once you've applied the lift, then you'll be able to boost uh, your production up um, from all the way up from 
all the way up to 50%. Now, uh, two different decline rates are going to be applied here. One is the one that I have before the lift. And, that, and then my model will also assume that after the lift, you not only do have an increase on your output, but you also will have a decrease on your decline rate. Can I sustain these two parameters parallel to this one? Well, this is a matter of uh, discussion. It all depends on the model. Uh, bear in mind that this is model has only been established for hypothetical purposes over here. But that, I am assuming, the life or the world before the left and then whatever happens after the left. Now, um, I am making a very simplistic assumption over here with uh, respect to oil price, as you can see over here. My simplification is a world without any um, uh, variations in terms of my oil price. I am assuming the same fixed price of 50, obviously. Uh, certainly, much more um, complicated models can be built upon here, especially if I add the time series analysis tool over here, which would allow me to build uh, oil prices a long time. Now, over here, there's uh, something else, uh, another risk making to function, which I'll explain in, in a minute. And as you can see over here, these parameters then have been laid out in order to depict for my output. Output would be the most important thing over here. So let's assume, for example, over here that I may want to test that after month 13, I may be able to test for different uh, variations on my lift. My question here is whether it pays to do the artificial lift and after month 13, which is the best month to do that uh, left over here. Uh, so I'll compare my two worlds over here. What would happen on my output without that left and what would happen with my output with the left. We're, uh, we start with the same point, 706.18 at this particular iteration. Take a look that every single time I'll hit F9, I'll have different results and they have been produced over here because exactly the way the model has been uh, modeled over here. So these two curves or these two columns are being modeled and graphically depicted over here. So as you can see over here, I'll start a monthly production all the way up to month 13. On month 13, I'll apply my boost, which will cost me this, which will increase my production on 44% and which will also, in this case, take my decline rate from 6% to 7%. Out of that, my new decline production curve will eventually run out all the way up to month 60. So as you can see, the way the model has been placed, every single time I'll hit up F9, I'll get different curves in which I am recognizing the very variable nature of the oil and gas business. You don't have control upon your output cells and that's been recognized on each one of these cells. You don't have control of whatever output you have over here up to a certain point. And then I'll be able to convert this world with this world without the lift and with the lift. So let me run this, in this case, uh, just one scenario. And the scenario over here, I'll just run it starting on month 13, the month in which I'll do my boost. And let me run, for example, 5,000 iterations here. And this is what happens. The software will start itself, will prepare itself to run. And as you can see, what, what's going on over here, let me just pause it for rearranging some of the objects on top of my model. So you'll be able to see what happens during my simulation run. So the software over here at risk on top of Excel is actually uh, generating different numbers for each one of my input variables that I've uh, defined over here. It is obviously out of that and out of my uh, formulation on my model, being able to not only formulate my output without the left, my output with the left, and it is depicting that on an NPV uh, cell over here. Now NPV, is essentially the NPV, the, the, the net present value of the savings that I'm getting out of this uh, production 
differential. So it's uh, the NPV of my savings, of my differences between outputs once I've considered the expenditure I have here on top. Now, it's um, modifying itself. It's uh, simulating rather slow. I can always speed that up by turning off my updating Excel feature over here. So it'll, sunrun, it'll start to run much faster, although I won't be able to see my Excel changing because it's become like frozen. I can also do the same thing with my chart, uh, turning off my updating Excel or my updating chart feature. So the software will eventually run the 5,000 iterations much faster. And at the end, this is what I would get. Do I have a positive NPV over here? Well, take a look at this by making a decision up front. There's actually a 73% chance of having a negative outcome. And the mean is certainly negative. In other words, it doesn't pay to make at that cost my change on my artificial technology lift. It just simply doesn't pay. And we all know the nature of what's going on over here. Uh, for some reason, I took uh, roughly some um, uh, real life figures. And that it all depends essentially on prices. At these low prices of an estimated or price of fix of 50, I mean, nothing is uh, uh, profitable at all. If I were to lift this to 70, 70, and 70, and run this once again fast again, 5,000 iterations, things might start to change a little. And then I'd may, I may be able to see that at certain points of my simulations, I may eventually get a positive NPV. In other words, cell B11 over here, as you can see, is just a depiction of my cash flow difference over here up front with this up front value. And then I may, me, I, I may be able to see results and see that still at those prices, I may still be getting a negative, a number which is slightly positive. But on average, I still have a 57% chance of making a negative number. This is an interesting case at a oil price of 70. Because at this price, as you can see, even though on average, I may make a little bit of money uh, from a probability standpoint, given the very asymmetric nature of my NPV curve, I may be able to see then that there's uh, more than 50% chance of making a negative outcome over here. Probably $70 is still too low a price on oil to make decisions on artificial lifts. It, it does make sense from an intuitive uh, point of view. So this is one tool, once again, um, uh, the way these conference or conferences have been laid out make it a little bit uncomfortable uh, because it, they're unidirectional. I'm just presenting over here, just leaving opportunity for you to present uh, and ask your questions. But probably we may open a window of opportunity over here. I don't know if there might be any questions, probably one or two that we could answer now at this point before we go beyond. Oh, oh, sure. That's a, that's a good idea. We do have a couple questions that are pertinent to this. Can you calculate the costs necessary for P25 greater than zero? In today's context, yeah. vendors might negotiate down to get the business. That's a good question. Uh, would you please uh, um, repeat so we will have a whole context again? It, oh, sure. It seems to have a couple of, a couple of uh, components. Yes, yes. Can you calculate the cost necessary for P25 greater than zero? Yeah. And um, the way I implied that is that given the cost of the artificial lift expenditure, can we goal seek somehow, let me try to reword that question, in order for the P25 of my NPV be a certain value, a certain uh, value. Let's put it this way. Given these parameters over here, I can come over here and see that my P25 of this cell is at this case still negative. It's at $52,000, or I'm sorry, $45,000. So the question can be over here. What is the negotiated cost that I can have on my artificial lift expenditure 
which in this case becomes a certain number. Say, for example, this were to be $20,000. Now this is a given. What would the value of this sale would be in order to make the 25th percentile of this sale be equal to zero? As you can see, wording that that way, we're actually looking for a way for the software to do an advanced goal seek analysis. Let's put it this way. This is an interesting question. Let's put it this way. I want on sale, and my output sale in this case is only one, it's NPV, and I want the 25th percentile of that sale. The syntax in which we include percentiles is in terms of one being 100%. So 0.25 would be my 25th percentile of NPV being equal to zero by changing, that is my unknown, is going to be, in this case, my deterministic cost being provided by my vendor. So in other words, over here, the software will calculate many iterations or many simulations, and it will eventually converge for a value in which this makes its, um, its uh, equilibrium, its balance uh, standpoint. So if I go over here and analyze it, I won't do that right up front. Let me just exit at this point because I just want to speed this up. And instead of uh, achieving a precision with 5,000 iterations, let me do it a little bit faster with, uh, say, 2,000 iterations to make it faster, a little bit less precise but faster. Let me go back to goal seek, take a look once again on my uh, the way I've uh, defined my, pro my, my problem. Once again, what is the artificial left cost that would make the, the 25th percentile of my NPV being equal to zero. If that is the question, let me then analyze. What would happen over here? The software will then start looking at different answers, uh, an amount of 100 different simulations of 2,000 iterations each. You'll be able to see down here that the software is solving for zero over here, NPV being equal to zero on the 25th percentile, and it solves itself. Once it has the answer, it will update it to this amount. So given an amount of 35,000, you'll make that the 25th percentile of this cell being equal then to zero. How can I test for that? I can always ask for the risk percentile of my output cell being equal to 25th percentile. And as you can see over here, this num number will eventually rough itself down to zero. It is not making it precisely to zero because of my precision on my model. If I want to include more precision in my model, I would probably have to go one to 5,000 iterations and run that again. If I don't feel that $454 is close enough to zero or close enough for the 25th percentile of NPV being equal to zero. Once again, this is uh, running much faster than what I originally thought. Once again, the software is running, as you can see, sets of simulations of uh, 5,000 iterations each. It's already running the fourth one of them. It's already um, retrieving results over here, and voila, it's uh, solved. One, once it solves, it updates the information with it, and as you can see over here, now the answer is roughly the same thing, $36,000, which would make the NPV of $25,000 roughly equivalent to zero. So as you can see over here, it is roughly equivalent on which 24.6% of your data is beyond zero. Does that answer your question? It looks like it does. It's, uh, do you want to take one more or do you want to? Yes, go ahead. Oh, good. Can you automate the process to cover all possible months when you can do Yes, this? absolutely. I wanted to do that. The way to do that, actually, that was the way it was originally designed over here, was a one in which instead of working for the month to do the lift, which is the 13th, the big question here is which month, and this would be optimized. So is this 13 or 18, all the, all the way up to 24? What is the optimal month? 
So one way to do it without the risk optimizer, which could uh, be performed also, would be to construct a SIM table. A SIM table will try different numbers of months, say starting on month 13, all the way up to, let's say for the sake of uh, shortness, let us try all the way up to month 37, 30, 36. That is, we'll test 24 different months. So the software with the SIM table function will test 24 different simulations, and for each one of them, will render me different NPVs over here. As you can see over here, I may have different answers for the mean of my NPV on column R being tested for different models over here. As a matter of fact, I did this all the way up to the end, to 60, 60. So I'll, let me just do it all the way up to the end as well. So over here, the same table will test from here all the way down. So that's 48 different months. I'll close that. I'll simulate now, now 48 simulations. And once again, to make it faster, although I lose a little bit of convergence of precision, let me just do a thousand iterations for each one of my simulations. If I turn on my demo mode, take a look at what happens on top of this cell. I'll start my simulation. So I'll see what happens. Let me just pass it over here a little to shrink it a little. So you can see at least for the beginning what, what's going on over here. Software is starting the first simulation out of 48. Each one of them contains a thousand iterations. So we're actually testing for the number 13, the first simulation on my sim table, which resides on cell B12. I can always speed this up, obviously, because otherwise it will take like 10 hours to run. So the software will then run, as you can see, it's already running the second, the third one, the fourth one. It is testing for different schedules for my month to do the artificial lift. If I were to somehow start updating Excel and updating my chart at any point, I can see, for example, now that I'm tating, testing my eighth simulation, the one that corresponds to my 20th month. And as you can see, I'm testing starting like approximately on, well, exactly on month 20. I can see what's going on with that, my NPV. Let me run that fast enough to do it all the way to the end. Take a look that by turning off my updating Excel feature and by updating feature, the software will run much faster. Instead of running 10 hours or so, it'll take like two, three additional minutes to run the 48 different iterations, or I'm sorry, simulations with a thousand iterations each in order to be able to see all my simulation process over here. Now, my software over here is running on one single processor. And that is because whenever you start with your demo mode on, you'll be able only to use one CPU at a time. My computer does contain eight CPUs that could probably be run much faster if I've decided to use them up front and if at the beginning I would have turned off my demo mode. Demo mode is pretty flashy. It does show you, as, you, as I've shown, my updating Excel feature and my updating uh, chart feature, but it obviously takes a lot of uh, working time for my processors to run all the way to the end. So as you can see so far, I'm running or I'm updating all the way up to my 29th simulation. And as a matter of fact, I am actually defining 48 different MPVs. So when I stop this model on this last column, I guess this is column R, I'll be able then to update the NPVs of respective simulation schedules for each one of them. In other words, I'll end up with 48 NPVs over here. We're almost at the end. It'll just uh, take like uh, 40 additional seconds for it to run. It's already run 41 simulations and see what happens here at the very end. I think those questions are just key. They're, they were just, uh, Jameson, like the precise questions to keep going on this. Good. OK, it's almost at the end. 
<laughs> okay, so okay over here. So as you can see, if I come back to my model, see what happens with my MPV. So as a matter of fact, if I were to chart them over here. What I get is a very interesting question. Given a price of 70 on oil, it does pay to make a decision on the first 13 months. If I started already in month, month 13, 13 plus 13 would give me 26 months. In other words, make a decision as fast as possible to do the artificial lift as fast as possible beyond month 13. After month 13, that is after your 27 month, it doesn't pay to make the decision. Given a couple of things, given the price of oil at 70, which is fixed, and given the upfront cost of $36,000, which was the, pop, the cost that we solved using my advanced analysis, we'll see. Okay? So any additional questions? Otherwise, we'll keep going on another feature that the software may have in order to solve these types of problems. Oh, there's a there's a couple more, but maybe we can answer those uh, via email. I'll I'll get them to you. Uh, okay. Yeah, that sure. that might be better. Okay, let's keep going then over here to show something else. <clears throat> As uh, we promised, or to deliver over here, it is not only at risk, and I may be unloading at risk over here and commit myself for the next uh, 10 or 15 minutes to do something with a, another tool. So let's start, for example, over here, our precision tree. So precision tree is another one of the tools that the Precision Tool Suite has in order to construct, to be able to build decision trees on top of your Excel spreadsheets. Uh, in a nutshell, once again, this is just another tool which on top of uh, your Excel and parallel to at risk will allow me to build a uh, decision tree analysis. In this case, I, I always go, especially for oil and gas models, to my example spreadsheets and be able in this case to build, for example, a, ba a very basic uh, decision tree analysis in which I may make decisions over here and this is a pretty straightforward decision in which you are decided, deciding on whether first decision to test or not, assuming that the test or for, a, for a specific uh, reservoir is going to cost you $55,000 up front, and based on whether the outcome of this test would give me either a dry, a small, or a large possibility of an oil reservoir, I may eventually make decisions on whether to drill or to not drill. So in other words, I have a couple of decisions that are being uh, decided over here on a sequence. First decision over here is whether I want to test or not. Second decision on whether I want to, uh, given the results of my testing, whether it sh I shall drill or not. Uh, whenever you build these models, let me just start from scratch, probably that's a better start point. Uh, you always start by defining over here, say that your decision here is whether you decide to get married or not, in which you would have actually two options on your decision, which is to get married, and that is yes, I do get married, or the other decision, the mutually ex uh, exclusive one would be to stay single. So um, decision tree analysis are actually decisions or trees in which we merge at least two types of uh, nodes. Decision nodes and then right after that chance nodes. And chances nodes are whatever happens after a decision, decision has been uh, made. The, decision, the chance over here would be how does it go? How is marriage? How is marriage? In which we, would ha we might have eventually, say, as much as many um, nodes over here. It could go well. It could go just uh, average. Or it could go really, really bad. 
So you would have to assign probabilities over here, and not only probabilities, but also you would have to assign different outcomes over here, a positive outcome, a, an average outcome over here, and then a very negative one. So as you can see over here, the software or the tree stretches itself in an intermingling of decisions on one hand, and right after the decision, a, an outcome or a chance of such a decision. Well, such an outcome or such a layout has already been laid down here for my basic precision tree model. One of the key things that happens over here is the ability for the software to tell me, that is to prescribe, strategy of what to do. As you can see, for example, once the model has been totally defined on whether it pays to test or not, you can see that there's a false and there's a true over here. That is actually the, the tree telling us to go and pursue the testing. Why is that so? Well, because the expected outcome of pursuing such a strategy has a positive uh, expected value of $545,000 as opposed to uh, $530,000 deciding not to test and obviously not to incur on uh, the testing cost. 545 being larger than 530 makes us the decision to go and pursue the testing. And once it's been achieved, we might make a second decision on whether the outcomes we had at this second stage. If it indicates that this is a dry, we could follow through and see then the decision would be not to drill. If it indicates a small potential reservoir, we might eventually then decide to drill because the three possible outcomes that stem out of this, given certain probabilities, would still render a very positive outcome. And if obviously it indicates that there's a large potential of drilling, then the decision over here would definitely would be to drill, given the fact that the oil found, or the expected oil value found over here, given the probabilities, and given the possible outcomes are going to be positive. Now, one of the things that happens with um, decision tree analysis is that you'll end up with something that is discrete in nature. In other words, when I define here that I have a small well uh, producing eventually $1.5 million of an outcome, this is just a definite number. If, it was, if this were to be a large well, I would end up with a 3.4 million. Uh, the fact of the matter is that I can also start incorporating risk, that is variation upon these cells. So I may be able to, and this is what makes it cool, be able to, for example, insert a distribution function on top of the cell. Say, for example, add a log normal distribution on top of that one, which would be with, say, a new amino 3.4 million, and then probably this, let us give a variation of say $400,000 uh, without any shift whatsoever. So as you can see over here, this is 34 million, yeah, 400,000. This is what happens on top of that cell. Same thing can be built on top of this one as well. Let me just add this as a low normal function uh, with 1.5 million over here. Uh, a certain standard deviation, 300,000, and that I could start building on top of that. Now, as you can see over here, the model becomes probabilistic. I may probably want to direct this to this one. I may probably want to direct this one to this one as well in order to generate the random outcomes just uh, um, being localized at a certain point. And thus, I am creating a probabilistic tree analysis over here. One additional to go over here on any one of the particular outcomes and one on the 3.4 million which is where my risk is. See what happens over here on my test decision. Test decision becomes then probabilistic in nature. At the end this cell which I can somehow stem out and declare it an output in Excel I can then link it back to my position tree analysis, come back over here, define how do I want my at-risk interaction be managed, and in this case I may be able then to run 
a probabilistic risk analysis on top of my oil decision. So if I may start my simulation, as you can see, I am actually generating on top of a decision tree, I'm already generating a tree which is probabilistic in nature. Once again, I can always speed this process up and be able to somehow draw 5,000 different iterations given, in this case, that I'm making the right decision. That is, that I'm making the prescribed decision. Because as you can see, this figure over here, or this figure will allow me to test or to make the right decision given that I am following the true statements at each one of the branches. So far, this is the way the model looks like. Let me run this all the way to the end, finish the 50 seconds that I may need to run this at the end. And this is what happens at the end. If I were, and this is the way to interpret this chart, if I were to follow the prescribed nature, then I would probably not make money or lose money in 56% of the cases if I were to follow decisions. As you can see over here, as a matter of fact, given the choices that I've got, there's even a like a 29% probability of making numbers between minus $250,000 and $300,000. There's a 27% chance of not making any money. And as a matter of fact, there's some chance of making a lot of money if you were to follow the prescription of whatever is going on over here. And that has been laid out by the ceiling of all the possible outcomes beyond a certain point. If I were to see the relative frequency of my chart, this is the way it would look like at the end. So once again, probably showing this in 20 minutes, 10 minutes wouldn't allow me to show the whole methodology. What I just want to show over here is the ability that we have of incorporating decision tree analysis by position tree and merging that together with that risk in order to build really cool models, in this case, using uh, both of the tools at the same time. Jameson, how about if we answer some questions now? Oh, sure. Let me see. We have a couple here. Can you have dynamic parameters by being linked to live data? Absolutely. You certainly can. Probably this is a question more related to... Uh, um, to um, at risk. So let me just do something over here, which is cool, which I was actually doing this morning with uh, one client. Um, if I were to have, for example, uh, I think I have something which is real uh, on the example, on the artificial lift model. Hmm. I don't have actual data here. Then we have a couple of examples over here from did an open. Something else. Uh, don't worry that this is in Spanish. The only thing that is in <laughs> Spanish will be the, will be the title. So don't worry about that. Uh, okay, this is from my hometown. I'm from San Jose, Costa Rica. Uh, so over here, for example, I have a database starts that it contains the last. Uh, all the earthquakes recorded uh, uh, from March 2009 all the way to uh, June 2013. If I were to, as you can see over here, I have the Richter scale for um, earthquakes in Costa Rica. This is actual data. I can do a distribution fitting over here, okay, and do a fit. Fit is the ability of the software. Here I already had some fitted information, so I can do the existing one. The software has the ability to, using the FIT tool, be able to suggest which is the best distribution. 
I don't want to get too much into details over here, but as you can see over here, according to the Anderson Darling criteria, the Weibull, and according also to the Akaike information criteria, the Weibull is the best distribution that would depict best what this distribution would look like. If I were to write it to a cell, let me place this on top of any cell, on top of that one could be. Now this cell contains a distribution function which given historic data points would be able to somehow calculate and see the very nature of my phenomenon. In this case, the Richter scale of historic data points. Now, as you can see over here, this is a Weibull which contains two parameters. The first parameter, or actually three, the first parameter on a Weibull, the second one, and then the third one, which is a, which is a shift. If I were to copy this, just to remember that, let me just copy that over there, so you'll be able to remember that. Now let us see and make this model dynamic. Dynamic in the sense that it will change parameters. If I were to define, instead of distribution fitting over here, a magnitude, uh, a longer range, instead of going to the 475, let me just add additional data, blank spaces over here, and then I'll make the fit. Repeat the whole thing, but at the end, let me do this. I'll link it. So in this case, whenever I have additional updated information, this information will update itself every time I'll see the data again. So I can come over here, place it, for example, over here on this cell for comparison purposes. Still is the same distribution function. But let me just then add some really heavy earthquakes. Let me add an 8.2, a 7.5 an 8.3, and then a bigger one at 9.9, .9, which is actually, I guess, impossible. Now, this information is going to be directly linked, and every time I'll simulate, for the sake of the exercise, let me just simulate 100 iterations, see what happens with this class over here. The software already simulated, take a look at this. This distribution is no longer a white If I were to see it, take a look that it's become different in nature, in this case this is a Pearson 5, which has been updated by the information through the usage of this particular subclass. The risk fit is a specific dynamically linked uh, tool that might allow me to look for the best fit according to the Akaiki criteria and given a longer range, update itself every single time the software simulates. So the answer to your question, not only do I have control upon the different parameters, but I also do have control upon the distribution function that I want. I don't know if that answers your question. Well, anyway, that was pretty neat. That was scary at the end, though, with the 9.9. <laughs> <laughs> As you can see already, I live in a very quaky part yes. of the world. It's a dynamic and, and beautiful place. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any additional questions? Let's see what we got that came in. Now, this refers to the very first thing you showed us. What does the MIU stand for in cell B1? Yeah, MIU stands for mu. Mu is the Greek word which stands for the mean in Greek. I mean, this uh, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not a statistician myself. I'm just, a, once again, just have a lousy MBA. <laughs> mu stands for the mean or the expected value. I mean, these great guys, these statisticians, like, they love to use Greek. So mean is, M I use mu is the Greek word for the M letter, and it means the mean. And then sigma, it's actually the standard deviation. Oh. This is the way it's been developed on any distribution function in which we use a normal, and we use mu and sigma. Those are the names of these Greek letters. Okay. Good. That's good. Uh, oh, one more. Can you go over the risk fit function that you used? Sure. 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 Once again, this is what I did over here in order to make it a dynamic. Since I already have it here, it's called magnitude. See that what I did here differently were two things. Hmm. First thing, 
I would define a larger, a longer range. So instead of going all the way from my first to the very end, I would stretch myself a little bit longer, okay? Just to leave for enough space of data. That's one thing. Second thing, I mean, once I've done the fit, the fit is being performed. As a matter of fact, actually the software will ask before doing the fit and it will warn me, you know, there's non-numeric values. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with that. As a matter of fact, I did include them on purpose in order to leave for additional space. So I'm okay with this. So the software fits. In this case, as you can see, it is fitting, fitting to a person five. I'll go to write to sell, and here is the trick. Okay, the trick is to not leave it on standard, which is just a static fitting function, and just to come back and leave it on linked. Now, there's two ways of doing the linkage. I could do the linkage and then the software put to look for the best distribution according to a certain criterion. For example, if I'm a favorite of the AD statistic, which usually tests well towards the tails of the distribution functions, so the software will look for whatever distribution function ends up first according to the AD statistic. Or, this is a big or, you could define and say, you know what, I don't care about whatever distribution lands on here on top. I do care by name. I always want to fit a Weibull, regardless of whether it's a good one or bad. So the software over here, as you can see, will fit always a Weibull. Or the software over here will always fit whatever has the one on top according to Anderson value. So as you can see, my fit clause actually changes with respect to whatever you decide over here. For example, if I insist on a Weibull and go next and place it on top of here, the software will then fit a Weibull regardless of what this is a good or a bad distribution with respect to whatever it had when I incorporated these additional data points. Okay? Good. Good, good. I have okay, any additional questions? Let's see. I have a... I have a precision tree question. It's kind of complex, but I, if you want to, I'll read it off. Skip it. Ah. <laughs> you know, those complex questions, are, <laughs> we can always, and I would be more than happy to answer on, on precision tree questions, this probably probably on an email. Yeah, I'll, I'll send promise you. to go to good, come back good. on that. Good. Okay. Let's see if we have uh, would you would you like to uh, just answer one more that let's see if we have one come in that that would help us all. I'm uh Let's just wait another few seconds. Maybe somebody's typing one. Oh, maybe. It, would you be able to uh, do an example in at risk using time series? Sure, absolutely. As a matter of fact, let me just look at something which is really cool. Uh, yeah, I guess it's uh, here. Okay, I think I have it over here. Everyone dreads this example, but you know, this is a fact of life that needs to be dealt. I have a database over here, which is a really long database, an official one, which entails and incorporates, actually the, the actual database goes all the way up to the uh, 20s on the last century. But I recorded here all the official world uh, accidents being recorded since wow. uh, January 90, 1990, all the way up to December 2014. So it's pretty well updated. As you can see, there's close to a 5,000 uh, airline accidents, not only uh, recording the date, the region, the operator, 
and even the aircraft, but it also do uh, record the fatalities over here. So at least out of this database, I can record two tables. One table records fatalities uh, for every single month as a summary on my outlook table, or my pivot table over here, how many fatalities occur per month on the last 34 years of aviation, and how many accidents themselves. Actually, they are somehow related, but they are independent. So for example, if I were to go over here and take a look at fatalities on the last 34 years of aviation, I can always do a time series analysis over here. So I can come here and fit and see what happens over here. Obviously, we have a high point over here, which is 9-11 on fatalities, which has been recorded over here as four different events. But as you can see here, this time series analysis is a tool in which the very first thing you need to do is over here just depict your series and then let the time series analysis do its job. What you want to do over here is uh, achieve stationarity, which could be manually performed by making transformations. Or the other way to do it would be for the software to take itself the auto detection feature. And the software will then suggest what types of transformations are needed in order to achieve stationarity on your data, which is always a good starting point whenever you want to do um, uh, time series analysis. If I were to somehow uh, here use any one of the 11 models that the software has, I'll come over here and fit, and the software will then give me a forecast of fatalities for the time being. In this case, the software tells me that MA1, that is a moving average of first order model, would be the best model that, according to the Akai information criteria, would be the best model in order to achieve for um, time series analysis of fatalities. If I were to turn this model on, you'd be able then to see your bands of probability. I can always uh, uh, somehow uh, shorten the ceiling over here to make it a little bit shorter. And then you'd be able to see how does this look like in terms of fatalities. So there's a 50% chance from your P25 to your P75 that this is your range of fatalities along the next 100 months. And then you could choose for any one of the other models mm -hmm. in order to see that. Now probably a more interesting model, if you, uh, if you travel a lot, such as myself, would be to go in terms of accidents. It does look relieving to take a look at accidents over here from time series analysis through the transformation. The software, once again, allows and makes the transformations automatic on a logarithmic function and a detrending first order differencing function of fit. And as you can clearly see here, there's a definite downward trend on accidents on the last 34 years. Just by taking a look at this, this is the number of accidents per month that have been recorded. And given that aviation has increased substantially on the last uh, 15 to 20 years, you can always see that even though aviation has increased, um, accidents per month has substantially decreased, and they tend to decrease into the future. So as you can see over here, you can always turn on this icon over here, and then be able to see the forecasts of how many accidents per month can be recorded over here. So I can probably say that, for example, in the next forecast month, there's going to be from approximately nine accidents all the way up to 14 accidents per month, but this trend will eventually uh, decrease, and by 100 months into the future, that is like in, I don't know, nine years, probably your average or your P25 to your P75 will decrease to from seven accidents per month to approximately 11 accidents per month. That is something that you can recall over here. Obviously, you'll never be able to somehow um, take this information uh, literally, because then you would have to forecast this. And obviously, this is just your starting point, because over here, now you need to simulate. That is, to take this number, which is a transform function in Excel. Now, you would simulate, and out of the simulation results, be able to use the time series forecast into the future. Okay. 
Yeah. Wow. I haven't seen that model before. This is a this, <laughs> first this is time I've ever seen Yeah, it's uh, yeah, maybe it's comforting. Yeah. All the flying you do, I guess it is comforting to see. It should how be. Much. Yeah. It should be at least for me. As a matter of fact, take a look at this. Uh, this is what I recorded uh, on on U.S. carriers. This is the number of million miles that have been recorded every single year since 1960 all the way up to 2012. And you see that there's an incremental, exponential increase on the number of transported miles according to the uh, uh, Secretary of Transportation over here. This is a, a really, really uh, increasing growth. And given the number of fatalities per million miles, you see that back in the 90s, this is the number of fatalities per million miles covered. And how this number has decreased all the way up to from Amazing. 0 0.034 to 0 0.0012. So what we can say is that in the last 32 years, the number has decreased itself a threefold, almost threefold in the number of accidents per uh, million miles covered. So it's uh, three times um, safer to travel today than it when it was back on the 90s. That's what we can say out of this. I mean, can this forecast whether the next time you uh, fly, will you ever uh, have an accident? It certainly can't. You, you never know how to forecast that. But I can say that it's three times uh, much safer to fly now than what it was uh, 32 years ago. <laughs> That's great. Well, okay. well, what do you what do you think? Should we should we let you go? I there are more questions, but I'll email them. Certainly too. Well, it's already three o'clock, and I haven't had lunch yet. So I yeah, think... <laughs> <laughs> we should we should let you go, Fernando. Thank you thank so you. much for for picking up this webcast. This was this was really good. Thank you. I hope it's been recorded, and I hope uh, I've uh, shown a couple of uh, tricks here and there for the audience. I appreciate your time over here, Jameson. Thank you very much for giving us this opportunity. Looking forward to a second opportunity. Yeah. That would... That would be great. And thank you, everybody. <laughs> Have a good day. Bye-bye.